Noch in diesem Jahr will Tesla am Standort Grünheide mit der Produktion beginnen. Zum Zeitpunkt der Aufzeichnung dieses Interviews ist Elon Musk erneut in Brandenburg zu Besuch, um das Bauprojekt der Gigafactory 4 voranzubringen. Derweil liegt die finale Baugenehmigung jedoch noch nicht vor. Während Landesbehörden und Bauherr also versuchen, alles schnellstmöglich zu tun, um das Großbauprojekt abzuschließen, sind jedoch noch viele Fragen offen. Auf kommunaler Ebene, in den Verwaltungen, bei uns Wirtschaftsvertretern und bei den Bürgerinnen und Bürgern. Wie verändert Tesla unsere Region? Worauf können und müssen wir uns einstellen? Und wie können wir uns am besten darauf vorbereiten, auf die anstehenden Aufgaben in den nächsten Jahren? Erfahrungen mit Auswirkungen solcher Giga-Industrieansiedlungen haben von uns nur sehr wenige. Daher wollen wir mit jemandem ins Gespräch kommen, der bereits die Ansiedlung der Gigafactory 1 im US-Bundesstaat Nevada eng begleitet hat und der uns Einblicke gibt in die Auswirkungen der Region rund um Reno, die zumindest etwas mit der Situation in Brandenburg vergleichbar ist. Und an dieser Stelle begrüße ich den Präsidenten und CEO der Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada, Mike Kaczmierski. Mike, thank you very much for taking your time and welcome. Glad to be here and, and glad to help. Thank you very much. So, Mike, um, first of all, what are you doing? What is E-Dawn? Probably your chamber does more economic development than our chamber. Uh, we are a separate nonprofit that does economic development for the region. So what we do is we attract companies, we help the companies here grow, and then we encourage and support entrepreneurial organic growth. So I think we can really profit from your experiences so far. And uh, maybe you can tell us first, how was the initial situation like before Tesla decided to come to Reno? Well, first off, congratulations on Giga4. Um, I will say this probably a couple of times during the interview, but the tendency is to focus on change and problems and not all the positives that can come with a wonderful, exciting project like this. So I just want to remind everyone that this is amazing. Nothing positive doesn't happen without some challenges. That piece uh, up front, you're asking about what was it like before Tesla? Yeah. I got here at the end of 2011. Tesla got here at the end of 2014. So there were three years difference there. Uh, when I got here, our unemployment rate was 14%. We had no real vision for the region. We were a gaming and tourism town and anyone that's been to Nevada or to Las Vegas, we were considered a old Las Vegas. And there was really no vision out. So they brought me in from, from Colorado and said, okay, let's figure out what we want to do with the economic development side of the community because tourism and gaming are not coming back. When I came in, I set up a team and we focused, our board, and our community focused on advanced manufacturing as a target industry. We also focused on data centers, entrepreneurial growth, logistics and distribution, all things that match well with our, our base here. So I knew there was a lot of opportunity there. We got very aggressive in, in promoting this region for advanced manufacturing. We had very little here at the time. Uh, we had actually landed about 40 manufacturing companies. And then Tesla came up at the on the radar as a potential for the state. Uh, they were looking at, they were only allowed to look at one site in the state. And of course, politics comes into play. Um, the state decided they would look at Las Vegas because they were the dominant player in our state, even though we had better properties here. And we got involved and, and connected with Tesla and said, hey, you know, at some point we would really like to show you what's going on in the north. They came out and visited us after they did their big national search and found that they really liked what was here. And eventually the state got behind us and we landed them. Well, that, that three years of bringing in advanced manufacturing helped Tesla understand that we were a great community or a potential potentially great community for advanced manufacturing. In fact, just last month, we came out ranked number three in the nation for mid-sized cities for advanced manufacturing from just 10 years ago when we were, were not even on the list. So it shows you that you can move an economy forward. So what Tesla did was it took us from gaming and tourism and a fledgling manufacturing economy to a real player in the world of advanced manufacturing. We were considered a, an old dying you know, gaming community, and now we were an up and coming manufacturing community. 
That then allowed us to bring in even more companies not associated with Tesla, but came here because, okay, if Tesla's there, it must be okay. Looked at us, decided to come, and our economic activity continues to be very strong. Okay, Mike, but um, how was the reaction when Tesla decided they want to go to your region? Then the reaction from you as a representative of the economic development, but also from other entrepreneurs or from the population and the municipalities? Well, it was an incredibly um, important piece of good news in our view. We were still struggling. Our unemployment rate during that three years before they announced went from 14 to single digit, seven, eight, nine, but we didn't have all the momentum we needed. We were, we were successful, but what this did was it really accelerated our recovery in our new economy. So generally the community was very excited. Generally the, um, the uh, entrepreneurs were very excited because they, they see this advanced manufacturing company as more of a technology company than a manufacturing company. And, and you're talking about an economy that was moving in a certain direction. And what this did was say that direction is correct and we need to keep it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you said generally the reaction was pretty good, but what worries or problems did arise in the course of the settlement? Well, early on, you're going to have your normal anti-growthers, people that fear change. They were concerned about traffic. They were concerned about um, inflation. They were concerned about um, workforce. In some cases, you know, we were paying um, wages that were too low for our employees. When you bring in and grow the economy, employers would now have to play, pay their employees more to keep them. Otherwise, they would lose them. So there was there were obviously a series of concerns. Uh, they came into an industrial park that had all the resources from a water, from a, you know, infrastructure perspective, um, with one exception, probably, and that's the traffic, our, our I-80 corridor, the main corridor that links our metro area to the industrial park, about 15 miles of interstate is only two lanes each way and it's become very congested. So this one turned out to be justified, this concern, the traffic concern. It absolutely has been. Uh, we have, you know, this is a whole other discussion, but I think the community can help resolve that through, you know, we've got 50 buses going out now. Uh, we have, we worked with all the businesses in the industrial park to adjust their start and end times. And some were doing four tens and some were doing so that we could minimize when, you know, if you ring the bell at five o'clock and everyone gets on the road, you have bad things happen. If you can phase that into a two or three hour shift change, it's it's much more accommodating. And have there have there been other concerns that turned out to be justified, like I don't know, maybe on the environmental side or on the on the workforce uh, perspective or on the on the housing market, some things like that. Well, on the environmental side, no. Our, uh, our business park was well set up. Tesla is, is a true believer in environmental impacts, is moving towards a zero carbon footprint. They have all the right credentials when it comes to environmental impact. I mean, we don't have trees out there, so we didn't have people concerned about how many trees were disappearing and all that. Trees do grow if you plant them somewhere else, that kind of thing. But for us, environmental was not an issue. We had the water, we're adding water supply to that park through um, uh, effluent water, water that we have treated that we normally would put back in the river. We're now piping back out to the industrial center to reinforce their water needs. Those are all part of the long-term solutions to address the environmental side. Workforce, in my view, as an economic developer is the top concern. When you bring into a region and, and you're talking about I don't know what the population base is around Tesla. If you, you know, you, you said it's near uh, Brandenburg. And if you just drew a 30 mile circle around that and said, okay, how many people live here, work here? That's probably your immediate impact area. And depending on the roads and everything else, it's a lot easier because we have one road and you'll have 20 roads probably, or some combination of roads to that site. So your traffic implications may be far less. 
Um, but I would tell you your workforce implications will be serious. And when I say serious, I'm talking about when you bring in Tesla, and for us, you're talking about Tesla and Panasonic as a team, and up to 8,000 workers in those two companies, but you're also bringing in thousands of construction workers early on, not just for the early phase, but for continued development of the project. So you have to add in several thousand construction workers that come from that region. So if they were working on a project over here, they're gonna come work over here, then you've got an issue with construction challenges in another region. And those construction workers can come from hundreds of miles away. It's not just local, but local tends to be the immediate impact. And then your normal workforce, someone who's working in a shop or working in another manufacturing facility. And for us, I'll use US wages, but um, normal manufacturing jobs are in the $20 an hour range. The Tesla goal was to start in the 23 to 25 and get them to $30 an hour. So if you're coming in and you wanna work for a cool company and Tesla's hiring and you're a manufacturer over here paying 20 to 25, you're gonna lose employees that are gonna to go to Tesla. And so you're not gonna be happy. So what the first thing you do is you raise your wages and try and retain your good employees. So we have seen across the board rate uh, increase in wages. And you, if you draw that 30 mile circle, you will see the same thing um, when it comes to workforce, depending on a lot of factors. But generally speaking, if the wages at the gigafactory are close to wages, employees are earning somewhere else, it might be cooler for them, especially for the younger employees to work at Tesla than to work mm -hmm. at some other facility. So you will see a certain uh, attraction of your current employee base most of the employees are in that 30 mile circle. You will have a few come from outside. Tesla will bring a few key engineers into the region. So you'll have some uh, attraction of employees to the region as well, but workforce is a big deal. And then workforce is really complicated because uh, for us, we have probably 30 different organizations addressing workforce, whether it's attraction, whether it's education, whether it's our community college or university, um, our high schools. And so getting the whole ecosystem more focused on advanced manufacturing is something we've worked very aggressively on. And when I say ecosystem, it's not just one community college. It's not just one location. It's that whole team. So assembling, we, we call it a workforce consortium. We have over 40 players and we're small compared to you that come in on a monthly basis and we coordinate our efforts, not just for Tesla, but for workforce in general. And what are the challenges? You know, Tesla is part of it, a big part of it early on, but a declining part as you go forward, but the Tesla impact will affect other industries. So what is the consortium doing even down to the, the early education levels? Are we teaching STEM classes at, in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade? We actually have now on staff a robotics coordinator that helps push and promote robotics because of the STEM skills that we know when they pop out of the system in 10 years, they have a high potential of going to work for Tesla or a company like Tesla. You have to add probably another 30 suppliers and providers of varying sizes that will come to the region as well. And some will be in the gigafactory uh, percentage, 30, 40% maybe, many will choose not to. They'll say, I don't, you know, I'm gonna supply you this, whatever, but I don't wanna just supply Tesla. I wanna supply other people in the region or in the state or in the world. And so I'll be nearby, but they're gonna, they're then gonna start occupying some of your industrial space in vicinity of the Tesla facility. And again, that probably 30 mile circle, depending on how things are laid out. So you will get suppliers and providers, and you will also get an influx of people that want to work for Tesla. You know, usually they come in pairs. So you'll get one that'll go for Tesla and then another that may be able to fill some other positions. So in the workforce consortium, you're addressing your local challenge. You're, you're helping attract the right kind of talent you need for your region. But you're also trying to understand that this ecosystem doesn't just, it's not a switch that flips on. It is a, a continuum that really spans 15 years and you wanna impact on all 15 of those years, who's popping out of community college and how do we get them involved versus the third grader that may be interested. And it may be something as simple as every third grader gets a tour of the gigafactory 
to see if that's something they're excited about. So it's that whole addressing workforce in a continuum in a collaboration and not have 50 different schools calling Tesla and saying, I want to come by tomorrow and show my third graders your Gigafactory, but rather having a coordinated effort that sets up some kind of system so that Tesla can be accommodating. And otherwise, they get to the point where they just say no. I see. I see. Okay, great. So, and can you tell me a little bit about the, the infrastructural development during the construction phase and after the start of the production? Well, we were fortunate in that we, uh, Tesla went into a industrial park that was adequately resourced from an infrastructure piece. So the Gigafactory, they will figure it out. They have a lot of smart people. Um, you know, they're going to ask for help when they need help, but generally they're going to plug into an infrastructure that can accommodate the Gigafactory, depending on obviously, you know, they're, I'm sure, working with the uh, um, electric companies and the gas companies, all that, but there's probably adequate resource would be my guess in that region, so it's not a big deal. Um, the road piece is something that you want to map out early because we all know if someone says, I need to fix that road, good luck, because it ain't going to happen for three years. And I don't know how your bureaucracy is, but it may be more like 10 years for us. You have the advantage now of jumping ahead before it gets really bad and fixing it. Now, your road structure and system and investment tend to be better than ours. So it may not be that big a problem. It may be as simple as a couple extra turn lanes or you know, you know, some management of the traffic control systems, whatever. But it is it is a problem that um, helps stir up negative impressions of the project. When people are used to going from point A to point B in five minutes and it takes them 45, because of Tesla, you have people that are now unhappy with the project. Your media is probably much like our media. You know, there are millions of planes that fly every day, but the first one that crashes, that's what you see on TV for the next three days. So they're there for the problems. And when you have a big traffic backup, they're going to be there. When you have an issue of some sort, they're going to be there and they're going to beat the drum on negative information. You have to, in the business world, beat the drum on positive information. So there's some balance. They're not going to tell good news, generally not going to tell good news stories about what's going on. So you have to find a way to help promote the positives. And there are many positives. Yeah. Exactly. And maybe you can tell us a little bit, I mean, five years Tesla in, in Reno, Nevada now. So how did Tesla actually change your region? What happened with your municipalities and what charisma does, does Tesla have in this region? And yeah, where are you now five years after Tesla's decision? Well, we are showing up in the national rankings at the top of many lists on the top of growth, uh, on the top of manufacturing, on the top of, we, we were recognized as one of the top five cool communities in the country. Huge change in 10 years there. Uh, best place to raise a family, not something we were 10 years ago. It makes us more attractive to many other companies. So we're dealing with 150 companies right now that are looking at the Reno Sparks area as a potential relocation in some, you know, for, for many reasons, one, California is not very business friendly. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of desire to insource certain manufacturing um, products from, from Asia, from China. And so they're looking at this location as a potential and those rankings will help them say, yeah, this is a place we want to look at. And we deal with them, we show them the community, and if their wages are, are high enough, and really our big check now is wages, um, when I got here, we would bring in logistics companies that would pay nine or $10 an hour. And now a logistics and distribution company who would contact us and they say, well, we're paying 15 bucks an hour. We tell them to go somewhere else. We don't want them. We don't need them because they won't be successful here unless they're paying what we say is at least $20, 18 to $20 starting wage. So you essentially double the wage in 10 years of that industry's 
um, starting salary. And it shows across the board, our wages are up you know, 45% in the last five years in all industries. And what that does is obviously, if you pay your employees more, you charge your customers more. So if you go to a restaurant now, what used to cost for us $30 is now $50. And so there are, there are natural built-in inflation challenges that are part of the downside, unless you know, you're one of the employees who just got a pay raise. For those that don't want to be in this environment because we are in a growth mode, uh, they will grouse and they will complain and some will have to move away because they don't have the skills to earn enough to live here in a reasonable way. And that really touches on the other major concern. I talked about workforce and kind of beat that drum pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Housing. Mm -hmm. And that housing impact is dramatic. And we knew this, we predicted this. Um, our local governments have not accelerated some of the permitting processes for affordable housing. They've actually slowed it down in some cases. So we were coming out of the recession where we were building five or six, for us, five or 6,000 housing units every year. It was a big number, but we had done it for several years and the recession hit, the great recession, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, and we went to building almost nothing. Well, we had a small po uh, population dip, but as we continue to grow, our population now is 30% higher, and yet we're still below the five to 6,000 housing units. And when I say housing units, that used to be 80% single family, it's now 10% single family and mostly multifamily. And we're still, our rents have gone from single uh, one bedroom from 800 to 1200. Our two bedrooms have gone from uh, under a thousand to in some cases close to 2000. So the rents have gone up, wages have gone up, and it's a supply and demand issue. If we had been more aggressive on the housing side, especially affordability, and took that on early, and, and that's where you're gonna bump into some of your environmental uh, concerns and some of your community concerns, because you got a, you know, a community of you know, 100,000, that's 10 miles away, and I don't know all the communities, but just say there's one there, and you got a developer that comes in and wants to build you know, 400 condos or townhouses or apartment complexes, and the first thing people say is, well, you know, we don't want all that traffic here and we don't want this. So we don't. And so the next thing you know is that municipality drags it on, drags it on. When the developer penciled that project, it was affordable, but because he made all those investments early, he's now paying for that capital to sit there and the prices of those units keep going up. If we had just approved it and done it for us five years ago, we wouldn't have this problem now, but because we've been slow to react and we've had not in my neighborhoods and, um, you know, the anti-growthers that don't want to, you know, they want to look at the mountains. They don't want to look out at that apartment complex. So even though they don't own that land, that's going to block their view. So they're going to show up at every council meeting and, and, and pitch a fit that slows the housing process down and increases the housing prices. So somehow getting, a buy-in on housing is probably your greatest challenge. Mike, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your role, Edon. How did you support the settlement in the long term? And uh, how did Edon support the changes in that region? Well, we are fortunate. Um, and you may have to set something like this up. It sounds like you're moving in that direction where you have some cooperative group where you have all the players together, but we have a board that has, we have five um, municipalities, three cities and two counties for us, those governments. So we have five of those representatives on our board. We have our four education leaders on our board. And then we have the business community, including Tesla on our board. And so our board meets every month. And when we identify an issue, our staff will then take it on and work with the players to try and resolve it. And we meet on a regular basis. In addition to the board, we have that workforce consortium. We have a group with the developers that are addressing some of the housing concerns. So there are other groups in the region, but our board kind of serves as that community uh, connector to identify a problem early and then work to resolve it. We talked about the, the environmental aspect already before a little bit, and uh, but 
how would you from Edon rate the, the settlement in terms of sustainability and environmental protection, et cetera? It is better than any other business park in the state, probably in the nation. And when I say that, uh, Tesla is moving towards zero carbon footprint. Very few um, facilities of that size even consider that. Um, they're using renewables. They're, um, you know, many of their um, employees go out through public transportation. So they're trying to reduce their footprint that way. Uh, obviously, a lot of electric cars um, have an, a positive impact. And then I think overall, the employees that work there are very environmentally conscious. They want to save the planet. And so you have an attitude with the facility that's not necessarily about making money, it's about making things better. And that attitude starts to embed itself in the region in a way that we have more discussion and more efforts towards sustainability and things that have nothing to do with Tesla. But because those employees or those employees, family members or partners are involved in other things, they are influencing the community to be more focused on, you know, climate change and sustainability and other things that 10 years ago we didn't even consider. And you talked about that uh, you, you have this board where uh, members of the municipalities and also, if, if I understood you correct, that also um, representatives of Tesla sit in this board, right? Correct. Okay. Um, is there like how does the cooperation work with tesla is there has there always been the willingness to cooperate with you from edon and the and the representatives of the region or did this willingness grow how is the the cooperation with tesla going because we experience that uh, the communication and the cooperation with tesla is uh let's say it's Crappy. limited on it's limited Thank you very much. Uh, it's limited <laughs> on on some on some aspects, and uh, on other aspects, there's nobody to talk to. Tesla is a very um, you know they try to be real uh, entrepreneurial. Their focus is um, certain number of cars produced, and the employees are told that is your focus. Don't mess with all this other stuff. Their leadership initially was we don't have time for that if we got a problem we'll let you know but you know we got you know we got to reinvent manufacturing we got to reinvent this we got to and so they were uh, phonetic in their efforts to get things going at the gigafactory they i think they've got a system down now where obviously gigafactory four they've been through it they're a lot smarter they're so it's a little less um you know chinese fire drill kind of thing where everyone's running around trying to do something a little bit more organized, but they still function a lot like a startup. Um, they're not um, some major organization that um, has a structure that they've worked on for a hundred years. They're still kind of new. And Elon is um, unique in his personality and his management style. And in many cases, because of that, he's reinvented things people thought were not possible. But the downside of that is they're so focused, they don't understand or appreciate how much of an impact they have on the community at large. And in all honesty, it may be on their list, but it's really low on their list because they have so many other things that they've got to get done and they have a very tight time on. They don't like to say things publicly because the media dissects it and blows it out of proportion. So you're not going to get the same kind of interaction with Tesla you would with another, with a BMW facility. You, it's different. Treat them and expect them to be more like a startup. You're going to get key people. The person on our board is the leader in the region on workforce development. And he has all the connections with all the leaders in the facility and even all the way back to Fremont, where the major headquarters is, but he's on our board really to, to see how we're helping on the workforce side, because that is a direct concern to that facility. And this robotics center that they helped fund, obviously, is a, a long-term impact on the success of that facility. 
So if you put yourself in their shoes and say, okay, it has something to do with our success, you know, you'll probably get their attention. But if it doesn't, that's the community's problem. Don't expect them to come in and be a community leader. Don't expect them to come in and all of a sudden, you know, sponsor a bunch of stuff, unless it's in the education world. If it doesn't have a link to workforce or education, you're probably not going to, um, your expectations will be misguided if you expect more from them. Unlike a lot of more established companies where your leadership corporations in the in the region and the executives on the committees and they're out there talking to people and they're at, you know, they give updates. None of that happens. None of that happens. So by having someone on your board or your committee or your chamber or your whatever um, and getting updates, you can help them help themselves because they don't do a very good job of talking about all the good things that are happening, all the success they've had. This robotics facility, for example, we made sure Tesla was included as a key player, but they didn't, they chose not to say anything. Mm -hmm. So back to that media piece, you know, they're going to do some things. Most of it's quiet. Most of it's below the radar and they're not, you know, you're going to have to pull information out of them. And then in some cases, you're just going to have to, you don't ask them for permission. You just say, you know, you find out what's going on and you inform your community. Okay, here's what's going on. They have this many employees, you have this, this. You can't ever say Tesla says, because then that shows up in the media stream, obviously a publicly traded company and people get upset. So you can say, here's, you know, here's what, what we understand is going on. And it allows you to keep people informed in a less um, stringent way, in a way that allows them to be comfortable with you because if you start quoting them, they'll shut down and you won't, they won't even talk to you. So they don't trust you yet, probably. Um, so they're not going to communicate with you in a way you would like until you can establish relationships that they can pass information to you and you can help promote it without saying, I got this from Tesla. Because then it shows up as something that hits the media across the world. Well, our talks with Tesla so far, like the Chamber of Commerce where I work for, um, have been exactly in this, yeah, in, in this aspect of skilled labor forces, because we have this uh, vocational educational training here in Germany, this uh, educational system of a skilled workforce. And uh, it works like this, that if you if you want to learn a job, you work in a company, but you also learn something in school. And the whole exam and everything is administered by the Chamber of Commerce, right? So we are responsible actually for giving Tesla the permission to train people, to officially train people. So and in this regard, we are in talks with them because, of course, Tesla wants to employ and train their own workforce. And so this is the only aspect where we are actually in active talks with them right now. And the skilled workers and training aspect is uh, something I want to I want to talk to you uh, with you a little bit a little bit more now. Um, you already mentioned that there has some influx of skilled specialists, especially from Panasonic. That's what I read. Uh, people coming from from Japan into this region, uh, even yeah. And uh, is there only that they? like import the skilled forces in, in, in the Gigafactory one, or do they also train the people to some certain extent? What are the, how, how does this work in your community? What are local companies also doing to keep up? And how do they keep their employees that they don't lose them going to Tesla? How is this working out? Well, first, um, Tesla's preference is to hire talent in the region. That is the least costly way for them to meet their workforce needs. So if there's talent in the region that with a little bit of work they can get um, to do the job at Tesla, they're gonna attract that talent, which most of those people are employed right now. So you've got employers that should be worried. Um, that's their first preference. What's the talent in the region? Then they jump outside that probably 30 mile circle to 
you know, okay, where else can we draw people in? And so they look at a larger region, maybe a large metro area that may be an hour away, and can they connect to that metro area through some kind of transit connector or something? So their real focus is who in the area can they upskill or train to do the job? That's their first preference. Least costly, most likely to be successful long-term because they're already comfortable in the area. They don't have to worry about housing. They don't have to worry about a lot of other things, moving their kids and school and all the things. So that's their preference. And that's really, um, that will have an impact most significantly in that 30 mile to 50 mile circle. Their second preference then is, okay, we don't have the talent here. We got to get this thing done. Who do we need to bring in here to get this done? And so they'll look outside of that circle, probably still in the country and say, okay, we got some engineers up here that could really do well. We're going to bring them down here. We're going to pay them a little bit more. They're going to live in a hotel. We have a hotel downtown that is almost totally filled by Panasonic and Tesla engineers. And they're there in a, in a four day a week mindset. They come in for us. They come in from Fremont in California. They come up in a bus. They occupy their hotel rooms. They go out to the Gigafactory. They're bussed out, bus back. They do their work and they go home on three day weekends. So that's their second access. That's not as cheap as local. That's not a permanent solution. That's until they can get their employees here trained up. So they'll do that second. Um, then their, their long-term goal, I talked about education system. That's where, okay, they see this is getting them up and running and going, but now, you know, what are we going to have in three years? What are we going to, what is our community college doing to help meet the needs so they have relationship now with the local community colleges that do a lot of the training they partner with them they take them out there they have apprentice programs where they can actually um at at our k through 12 which is our elementary they have it at the community college they have at the university will actually bring allow engineering students to come out and work at the gigafactory two days a week or they bring in um students that will work during the summer out at the Gigafactory. So they, they have these different programs. They try and get people, they're looking at is the system in the region from a future workforce perspective oriented towards meeting our needs long term. So that's the you know, second phase of the workforce side that we've really uh, refined pretty well here. And they're using that model in other locations. So you're going to see probably the same kind of thing here uh, addressing that future workforce need once they get the Gigafactory up and running, which is you know, 18 months to two years. The last option is actually moving people. So bringing people in from Japan, let's say for Panasonic, or bringing people in from um, California and having them live there and work there long-term, that's very expensive for them. And that's, you know, they'll do that for their senior executives. They'll do that for the leaders they need, but they can't afford to do that with their 5,000 person workforce. So you said that, um, first of all, they want to use skilled workers that are already there in the region. And this means that those employed in some other companies, they will leave that companies. And how do, do they, do these employee employers actually cope with that? What are they doing to keep their employees in this situation of very, very tough competition with Tesla? What we do is we go do a, um, a uh, pay assessment for them. We come in, we say, okay, here's the workforce you have. Here's what you're paying them. Here's the 50 percentile. Here's the 75 percentile. If you don't want to lose your employees, you need to pay at the 75 percentile or they're, they, they're going to leave. They're not just going to Tesla. They're going to go somewhere else. And you know, the initial response to that is my employees love me. They're not going to leave. And, you know, six months later, half their employees are gone and we're getting these frantic phone calls. And we say, remember what we told you. You got to pay your employees competitive ranges of what the market bears, not what you think the market bears. So I think part of this is your challenge to educate them on what the wage structure will be for them. If they're paying more than Tesla, they just need to treat their employees well and they're going to keep them. Let's face it. If they're paying a little less than Tesla and it's a drive to Tesla, they can probably do some 
you know, things to make their employees a little bit happier, but focus on employee retention as a new priority for existing industries is important. If they're well below Tesla wages, and I, for us that's $25 an hour, um, they're in trouble. So maybe now instead of saying, okay, I'm gonna pay all my employees $30 an hour and I'm gonna keep them, maybe now is the time that company says, and we do automation evaluations for them as well, do you need to keep paying these employees as wages? You're gonna lose some of them. Rather than do that, that savings is time for you to up, you know, invest in your automation and get the robotics and automation you need to be a 21st century company. And that may mean helping them get loans and the government assist them and do some other things. So now you have a facility that is viable for the next 20 years, but only needs 100 employees. And so help them understand just because they needed 300 employees 20 years ago doesn't mean they're going to survive in that model for the next 20 years. Can we talk a little bit more about the, the living aspect? Of course, if people already live in this region, they are set up with houses, apartments, things like that. But in the beginning, you told me that you have a huge housing issue. And this is especially true for the people that are coming into this region, not only to Tesla, but also to the suppliers of Tesla, right? So is there a concept? Does Tesla have a concept for employee living or company owned apartments? Is there something like that? No. Tesla will recognize and acknowledge there's a housing problem but that's not their problem. They're paying their employees what they think is good wages. It's the employee's problem and the community's problem uh, to figure it out. So what happens is some of our young engineers will come here and share a really nice um, apartment for, for us, a fairly high market rate, but they'll share the rent in there and they'll live there and they'll be happy. And they have two bedrooms and they share that, you know, so you'll see some of that. Um, what it really affects are the people that are in the shops or the lower wage employees who see their rents go from 800 to 1200 and their wages don't go up that much. Mm -hmm. So those lower level, um, because now that same unit that was 800 is now being rented out at 1200 by someone that can afford it. And these people are being kicked out or, you know, our homeless numbers have gone up. We have a whole nother initiative towards ho addressing homeless, especially working homeless. Um, not as big a problem for you, something that we're working on. That we have a pretty good plan for uh, and we're making progress. But part of that is people are being kicked out because there's not adequate housing for the lower income jobs and people that have been paying, you know, I don't know if you see dramatic rent increases or have in the past, but for us, that was pretty shocking expected. Um, I, and, and the community at large, didn't believe it was going to happen. And now that it's happened, we're trying to play catch up. And, and the people that are suffering the most are the ones at the lower income levels. But how did the communities react to that situation? Is that is that there is some state sponsored building now going on in the region or what is how, how do you address this issue? We don't. The, the elected the official, market? What? the elected officials here say that's a market problem. Developers will come in and say, OK, I can build three or four hundred units here. And I can make a lot of money by renting them out at 1250, you know, one bedrooms or, you know, I got some two bedrooms going for $3,000. Everyone laughed when they built it. They're now going for that rate. So they're building at market rate. Unfortunately, market rate is not addressing housing affordability. So it clearly is. And it's not just Tesla's problem because Tesla is only 5% of the jobs in the region. It's the growth associated with Tesla and our economic recovery that's allowed for other growth. And what I like to say is, okay, what you're saying is you don't like growth, so where are your kids gonna move because you can't stay here? They gotta go somewhere else because we, we can't grow and have a job for them because that's growth. Where are your grandkids gonna be? Are they gonna be in another country, another state? Because they can't be here because you don't like growth. So people don't understand growth is a normal part of a community's development over time, it's just, this is 20 years growth in five years. 
And so you have to do things a little bit differently. Let me address one one uh, one little aspect again, um, specifically to the production aspect of, of Tesla. Can you tell me a little bit where do the supplies and the imports come from? Is it all U.S. supplies, and is it coming near Nevada, or how do they do they do that? Well, it's really global supply, global supply chain. The closer you can get it, the better. We have lithium mines nearby, for example, in battery production. So there's a relationship with some of the mines we have in the area from lithium production that goes in the batteries, it goes in the car. So we have some of that. We have um, Tesla likes to keep their suppliers and providers nearby and likes to have control over them. So there's going to be some of that that will come from other parts of the country or from outside the country, depending on um, what Tesla finds most um, beneficial to them. I see. And how do the supplies arrive to the to the facility? Is it all done by road or is it railroad? How do they? Their, their preference is rail. Uh, we have the business park we have has some rail issues. So the vast majority of what they uh, deal with now is through trucks. And um, they'll truck it to the rail station. So it's not all on the highways all the way up and down, but they'll truck it to some of the rail connections and then rail back and forth between California, for example. We have the Port of Oakland. So you'll get some of that that comes up here and then goes from the rail station up to the, up to the park. So you have a combination of things. Their ideal situation would be as much rail as possible. Okay, and the trucks already, they also use the same highway, I guess, that the, the, the commuters are using. And um, is there, has there been any infrastructural measures been taken on to, to cope with this more traffic? Well, we're fortunate that if you look at a map of Northern Nevada, Reno's and Sparks are really the one major metro area and even this is less than a half million people so we what we don't have is in a lot of places you'll have you know a half million people and then 20 miles away you have another hundred thousand and 20 miles away you have another hundred thousand and so you have more of that in germany and on our east coast and on our west coast but not here but we have 80 percent over 80 percent of nevada is is a government land that has no development so we have a lot of open land so we don't have that dramatic traffic and the timing of the trucks, you know, you don't necessarily move the materials when the people are coming to and from work. So you don't have that, you, you time it so you can kind of avoid some of the pain. So we talked about a lot of aspects. We talked about production and traffic and skilled workers and, and living. And uh, the last aspect I want to talk to you about is community. How did the phase of the region changed? with Tesla's decision coming to Reno? What we got is a facelift. As a community, we are now considered in this region as an up and coming technology and advanced manufacturing location. So that our region now is much better set for success long-term. We were ranked third in the nation as attracted to millennials. So you're starting to look at talent that wants to be in the region, which helps us be a place where your family and your, your kids and grandkids want to live. They're not going somewhere else to be cool. They can be cool here. So the facelift part is incredibly important. Uh, we talked about a lot of the negatives. The positives continue to be wage increase. Wages now are, are up pretty dramatically. Uh, our education institutions are very attractive to other students who want to come here, go to our education institutions so that they have a chance to work at Tesla or be part of our community. We have, fortunately, within 20 minutes, some amazing ski slopes, Lake Tahoe, a lot of quality of life nearby that complements what's going on in our region. So this has really helped us become a great place for people to want to live. Now, the cost to live here is dramatically higher than it was 10 years ago, but it's still dramatically less than California, for example. So people see, see, still see us as a as affordable place to live if you've got reasonably good wages and skills. 
And is, is Tesla involved in some uh, corporate social responsibility activities in the community as well? Tesla's not. They're there to make electric cars or batteries or components of both and not to fix your homeless issue or not to fix your roads or not to fix. They're not. That's not the way they operate. They still operate, in my view, a lot like a startup. And we're there to help them. They're not there to help us. Okay. And there's a lot of positives there that make the relationship work. And I think it's really an expectation um, issue. We can't expect them to, when they're, they don't even offer employee discounts in their cars, we can't expect them to dump a bunch of their, um, you know, they're barely making money now into the community when they're just trying to get this system up and running because they see the greater good is a world that is cleaner because of their efforts. So we're going to help them do that for the greater good. And we're going to get a lot of economic benefit as well. We're not going to get a lot of the social commitment you would get from other kinds of companies. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the investment, the big sponsorships, all these other things you'll tend to get from other kinds of companies. You, you mentioned a lot of time, a number of times now, the, the resemblance to a startup, Tesla and a startup. A lot of startups, they, t they take really good care of their employees and they take, they want to take care of their families as well. For example, um, kindergartens and they support schools and, and they support educational programs and they support universities, something like that. You mentioned already the, the uh, robotics program where Tesla was involved. Is there some, some similar that some th similar things like kindergartens and schools, high schools and university colleges, something like that? Well, they'll work with, they have some great programs to help high school students have um, apprenticeship programs there. So they connect again, it's all almost all related to workforce. And that's where they're going to put, they have to justify every penny they spend. And it has to be linked to the mission of Tesla. So employee retention is important to them, but they're not going to provide employees a place to live. They're not going to, um, you know, they'll help uh, reduce the cost of commuting, for example, and provide bus service and do things like that. So they'll provide some benefits there um, in order to make it more um, attractive to be an employee. But their focus is on, you know, changing the world through electric cars and not on, you know, are, they generally have a lot of people that want to work for them and people that believe in their mission are passionate about they want to do and don't expect to be given a lot of other benefits. I see. So a lot of tasks that uh, come with uh, with this um, vast majority majority of, of workers, um, the housing issue and infrastructure and maybe schools and hospitals and shops, all this growth pain, so to say, uh, is solely the, the problem of the community and the, yeah, of the government, so to speak. And Tesla is keeping their, their nose out of it. Correct. But their, their position would be, we're paying these employees hundreds, if not billions of dollars that go into your economy that you tax, that you, they buy things at the shop, they buy cars there, they buy, You know, they pay rent on the houses. None of that would happen without that investment. So their position is we're literally pouring billions into the economy in different ways. That's our investment in the economy. We're focused on our mission. Mm -hmm. And from your perspective, does your communities, do they, are, are they able to cope with the stress and with the, with the task that lay ahead of you? Especially, we, uh, especially we've done, uh, housing well, and infrastructure. Yeah, we've done okay um, on everything, probably but housing. And we have a strong contingent of anti-growthers that you know we don't have a lot of land here, so they don't want that apartment complex in their neighborhood kind of thing. 
and they have an impact on our elected officials that slow things down. So that's kind of a self-inflicted pain. You have a bigger region with more land to deal with and more communities to deal with. I don't think that'll be as big a problem for you. Um, and the infrastructure side, you're in better shape because of your road network is more better maintained and less focused. So, I mean, I think that's probably a positive. I would say the biggest thing for you is workforce. And then housing early on, getting past some of the, the NIMBYs and realizing, yeah, you need a couple of large apartment or housing comp complexes or condos or something you know, in that 30 mile loop, because there's going to be growth. And if you don't do that, all the rents are going to go through the roof. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if if I sum this up, then your your major uh, recommendation to our region would be to take care of the housing issue first. I would recommend addressing identifying your transportation hot points because that just ticks people off when they ha have to sit in traffic for a long time. And there may be easier fixes to that. In some cases, it's as simple as adding another turn lane or something. Uh, identify those and start to work on those now because you know that takes time. The housing, getting approval on projects as soon as possible. Because if you said, if you went out and said, okay, we've got this land here that's through all the approvals, it's approved by all the elected officials of the government, um, You'll have many, many developers come in and be happy to build it for you. It's that approval process that scares people off. And that's where you can help as a chamber. That's where we tried to help and have gotten some projects through that may not otherwise get through. So that approval process, the sooner the better. The road hotspots, the sooner the better. And then the education pipeline, addressing that and starting to think differently about that pipeline I would say is really important. And then ultimately focus on the positive because there's plenty of people that are gonna focus on the negative. Thank you very, very much, Mike, for your time. I know it's uh, very valuable and uh, you start the day now, my day is ending. <laughs> and uh, thanks again. Okay. Mike, have a great day. You too, and thank you all. All the best. Bye-bye. Take care, bye.